So um, basically, we're going to talk about bowel ultrasound, and mainly today is going to be regarding necrotizing enterocolitis and IBD. But the one thing that I do want to emphasize, um, whether whatever you're using bowel ultrasound for, is that you have to use a linear high-frequency probe and obtain cine clips in all four quadrants. And um, the reason being is that I know we're used to using the curve probe, especially for abdomen, just because you're used to using it for the solid organs, but for bowel, it's completely different. You're not really interested in all of the deeper structures. Um, there are some cases where you do wanna look for abscesses and, and et cetera with curve probes, but most of the time with the bowel, you're not interested in the deeper bowel or anything like that. You're more interested in the bowel walls and everything. So, you know, it's okay that, uh, I feel like a lot of people don't want to use a curve because they're like, well, I can't capture everything, but it's okay. You, you don't need to capture everything and all you need is just a superficial part of the bowel, but image that part well. So briefly, what we're gonna do is talk about why and when to perform bowel ultrasound and then how to perform it. And then as well as some example cases. So um, why I think like most things, ultrasound, it's portable. So it's easier, especially with this neonates, you can bring the machine um, to the NICU and then there's no radiation, um, of course. And then the bowel wall detail, arguably, I think is might even be better than MR uh, and definitely better than CT. So this is just kind of the bowel wall details that you usually get um, with a good kind of linear probe. Um, ultrasound. And so you can see the Haustra, you can see everything very clearly. And so you're wondering when you should use the ultrasound. And I think um, I tend to recommend it on patients that have a decreased or absent bowel gas, especially in the neonates or younger population um, infants where we're basically following a gasless abdomen day after day. And truly you can't really tell what's going on. Like, is there dilated bowel loops with fluid um, or is it just all collapsed bowel or, you know, is there ascites? So there's a lot of things going on that can be hidden that I think can be um, uncovered with ultrasound. In a gassy abdomen, I mean, you could try it. There's probably some things that you would be able to see, but um, usually it's the gasless abdomen that I tend to recommend um, ultrasound on. And then the second use is um, kind of following up more so with focus ultrasound where you already know where the disease is. And so this is usually in the population of inflammatory bowel disease where, you know, there's small bowel disease or terminal ileum or somewhere focal where you can kind of focus on. Um, and so in this case with the MR, you already know that it's going to be in this region. And so therefore you can do ultrasound um, in between the MRs to decrease costs and kind of follow how um, the patient is responding to treatment. As far as how to do it um, prepping wise, I don't think that there's anything published for um, bowel ultrasound prep, especially in the emergent or inpatient setting. Um, so typically in those patients, we just bring them down and ultrasound whenever um, the order is placed. Um, in the outpatient setting, and I would be curious to hear your guys' thoughts, um, is that, you know, we, we technically don't have any prep protocol just yet, but we do ask the patient to fast similar to just abdominal ultrasounds um, and, and essentially just nothing that's carbonated or milk, which would create more gas. Um, I know that in cases of strictures, you know, we try, we're thinking of giving or bolusing food, um, fluid, uh, non-carbonated drinks, just to, to see if we can get the same distension similar to MRE and C. TE, I guess. And so I don't know, Jeffrey, if there's like a, a beverage of preference or you guys prep in any way. We, yeah, we, we're very similar to you. So for, yeah, for ED, um, we don't have any specific prep. We just image those when those are ordered. Uh, for inpatients, we try to treat those like outpatients. You know, it depends on, you know, if they, what their, you know, feeding tolerance is, if they are capable of going a few hours without having, having anything by mouth, then we would prefer that. Uh, but we work with them as much as we can. Uh, for outpatients, we treat these similar to any kind of other abdominal ultrasound. So we have, you know, we have different MPO requirements based on the patient's age. Uh, we do not give them any specific um, fluid or anything ahead of time. I, I think it's an interesting concept. I think logically it seems like it would work. I don't, I don't know if that's been uh, studied or, you know, shown to improve image quality, uh, but 
Uh, we just have them be MPO. We don't actually give them any fluid ahead of time. Yeah, same. I mean, some some of the literature I've read, they haven't had any kind of um, enteric regimen recommended. There are some papers on like just evaluating the upper GI kind of or the upper um, aspect of the bowel uh, and giving fluid for that in neonates and evaluation for malrotation. But um, for IBD, not so much. But after scanning some, I thought about giving some kind of fluid that will stay within the um, small bowel tract and cause distension, especially for strictures, because I feel like the ones that I've scanned, the bowel is artificially collapsed because we kind of um, MPO them. But I think that's something that's probably going to require a little bit more research. So as far as, um, you know, what to give if you do to try to give contrast um, or enteric contrast is that, you know, for babies, we try to give sterile water. And then for older kids, they can drink some kind of juice. We haven't really established a protocol for that as previously discussed. And then, like I stressed before in the beginning slides, is that I always start off with a high frequency probe. Um, and then eventually, you know, move down the list depending on how big the patient is and what else I'm uh, interested in seeing. And then keeping your patient comfortable is um, the key, especially in babies, since you don't want to increase the gas from crying. And then also in older children, because they're already in abdominal pain, um, you know, just trying to see to, to keep them comfortable and laying there is, is key. And so as far as acquisition, you know, we all think of the abdomen in all four quadrants naturally. So I just start off in the right lower quadrant, kind of find the cecum, and then essentially just follow the entire large bowel um, in a clockwise fashion. And then similarly, if there's small bowel pathology, then it's either a focus exam in those areas um, more so, or, you know, you can later on scan um by location. So you already know where the colon is, and then you just try to scan a little bit more um, centrally. And what you want is just transverse and sagittal still, as well as color imaging. And then um, lastly, you know, just cine clips of each quadrants, um, basically looking for anything else that is not captured in the still images. And then peristalsis as well is also um, useful for the, the cine clips. And then um, we also add a midline clip. And um, you all know that I am very always curious about the SMA SMV relationship. So that's helpful with the midline clip. And then as well as the um, pylorus, and then you can also see the proximal duodenum and the entire duodenal course. And we specifically look for D3. So those are the additional cine clips that we um, obtain with the linear. And then this is where it's kind of optional where, you know, you can switch to your curve to kind of look for uh, pneumatosis as well as pneumoperitoneum, although pneumoperitoneum, you might need the linear probe still. So pneumatosis, um, you can kind of see uh, little bubbles, like gas bubbles on the cine clip, or if you do Doppler, you can see these little um, artifactual blips um, on the spectral analysis. And then pneumoperitoneum, you can see just kind of what you would expect air to be outside of the liver and layering um, in the anti-dependent portion. So okay. just what, oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I'm curious on, on the, for the Doppler images on these, um, have you found that, so, so we, I, I know we've talked about before that we have challenges in doing these, you know, spectral Doppler analysis on examinations that they don't specifically order Doppler. So we don't specifically do these like for our, our neck exams. We don't routinely do Doppler. Do you find this to be useful? Have you ever seen an abnormality on a Doppler that you haven't seen on grayscale? Um, yeah, that's a that's a good point. I mean, probably um, not as often because a lot of time it will be kind of florid. But I have seen some cases where you know, you kind of get a, a little blips, but it's the, um, the flow isn't so obvious. So like, you know, sometimes like slow flow and stuff can simulate a little bit of just speckle right, right. stuff. Um, but then it's helpful with the spectral analysis. Cause then you can actually see the tiny little peaks and assume that those are bubbles and not slow flow. Yeah, but yeah. That being said, I mean, we do spectral analysis on all of our abdomen um, without doing the Doppler charge. So um, I think our yield is probably much lower just because we do it on everybody. And one other thing I was curious about on your, as far as the SMA, SMV vascular pedicle, do you, 
routinely include that on your necrotizing enterocolitis protocol? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we we didn't at first, but we just recently added that. I was just curious if you kind of had a similar approach. You know, I, I know we've talked about before, you know, there's some that can kind of mimic each other sometimes. So I, I think it, it makes sense to me to have evaluation of the SMA, SMV in, in your necrotizing enterocolitis protocol. So, um, yeah. I don't know if um, oh, Catalina yeah. was trying to say something. Uh, uh, sorry, can you guys hear me? I'm having still technical issues with my computer. No, it's all good. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, my I've had like every single technological complication with my presentation and computer. Um, we don't do Docker, like liver Docker for our patients, for our NEC patients. Uh, we do include Docker for the evaluation of the power loops and the mesentery that I will explain later when I give my part of the lecture. Um, and we do include the SMA, SMB, and the course of the dual denominator, or all of our NEC babies. I mean, it's extra added information that doesn't hurt to have. So we do include it. And um, interestingly, you know, there are papers published on like just Doppler evaluation specifically of like the SMA index. So, I mean, potentially that's that's another area to, to evaluate. Um, so yeah. just, just um, briefly, you know, what does normal look like? So this is what normal colon looks like. You'll see a little bit of air, a little bit of soil, a little bit of gas. Um, bowel wall shouldn't be too thickened. And then small bowel, when they're all collapsed, looks pretty monotonous. Um, you should be able to see all five layers, but most of the time, the two layers that I think you can see reliably all the time would be the muscularis, which is this black thicker line, and then the submucosa, which is going to be the brighter line. Um, so sometimes, you know, all five can't be seen, but you should be able to see these two and then um, at least three because you always have to see that gut signature. Um, setting wise, we have Canon. So I have optimized our bowel setting, um, kind of driving off of the appendix setting. So that's something if you, that's what you guys have. Um, you can also talk to me a little bit more of how we tweaked it, but I made it so the walls stand out a lot more for a small bowel. And then of course the large bowel is going to have more gas. So you can only see the, um, the near surface of the bowel loop for, for that. So this is what we typically start with, you know, in the midline, um, and these are in young children, neonates, so you should be able to see everything pretty clearly. So this is the uh, gastric outlet. So this is the antrum. This is the pyloric channel. Most people measure, I think, over measure the pyloric um, channel at using the antrum, but um, Typically, you know, in a normal child, it should be very, very, very short. And then this is the muscularis layer in which you would measure for um, any kind of thickening if you're suspecting hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. And then this is the actual opening. And so that looks good. Um, and then the other thing we look for is going to be the proximal duodenum. So you have the pylorus, then you have D2 or D1, D2 near the pancreatic head, and then D3 crossing um, typically, if normal, should be crossing posterior to the SMA with, with this echogenic collar and anterior to the um, aorta. And so the first case is an 11-year-old female with vomiting. Um, and so, you know, we gave the, um, the baby some fluid, all this anechoic um, fluid here, and it doesn't seem like the pyloric channel, which is very um, elongated, it doesn't seem to ever open and it's thickened. But what I do want to note is that what's interesting is that um, the entire gut signature layers are thickened. So both the muscularis, submucosa, and the serosa, they're all thickened. And it's thickened not just at the pyloric channel, but all throughout the stomach. So that's important to note and differentiate from hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, where you can see here, there is a distension of the stomach, but the bowel wall is thin and only the muscularis layer is thickened. So this um, is actually gastritis and you don't want to do a pylotomy um, for this child because the, the muscle is actually pretty thin. And so you might cut right through that. So in these cases, you just figure out why the, the kid has gastritis and then treat appropriately. So I feel like that's a mimicker for um, HPS. Can I ask you one question about that case, Hentry? Yeah. I think that's a you know very good point to, as you know as far as you know we don't want to measure the whole entire pylorus but just that single muscular layer. Uh, one thing that came up with us recently is the another mimic of pyloric spasm. 
I'm curious if you guys have a specific approach to that. Like if you have a case that looks like your bottom case here and you're, you know, thinking it's pyloroctinosis, do you guys image it for a certain period of time afterwards to kind of show that it's not spasm, that it's kind of truly a persistent thickening of that muscle? Yeah. So we, we do do that. So there are some cases where it's like kind of borderline. And so you do feel like it's spasm, but you've been there for so long and it doesn't completely open. We have, um, there, I don't think we have like a set protocol, but we will say, you know, consider re-imaging in whatever time frame decided right. by that radiologist. Do you guys have like any specific standards that you go by? I, I've looked it up. I don't, I don't know if there's any specific literature on it. I, I usually would tell the sonographers that they see something that looks like pyloric stenosis to watch it for at least, you know, 15 or 20 minutes or so. Usually, you know, by the time they do the whole exam and kind of do the SMA, SMB and all that. It usually, you know, takes about 20 minutes or so. So I just tell them, you know, just go back and take another look at the pylorus at the end of the exam. Um, I don't know if that's specifically added value, um, but that, that's kind of the way I've approached it. Yeah. And do you feel like, um, I think another thing that is a little bit different in practice is that do you routinely... Or either one of you guys, do you guys routinely um, give oral contrast or sterile water for these pyloric ultrasounds? We do. Okay. We do give them uh, sugar water or we let the parents uh, feed the baby. Uh, the other thing that I teach my sonographers is to put the baby, first try with the secretions that they have, because if they're having oral intolerance, then I mean, not ideal to filter. Um, so the other thing that I teach them is to put them on their um, lateral decubitus to the right. So the, you encourage whatever fluid the baby already has on the stomach to empty to the pylorus. And we also scan for long periods of time, um, like same as uh, Jeffrey said, 15, 20 minutes to make the difference. Yeah, and we, we do the same thing with um, as far as the fluid administration. So it's a standard part of our pylorus protocol that we you know, if they're if it's a breastfed baby, we'll have the mom feed them or if it's um, or we'll give them Pedialyte. Uh, so we always do some, you know, just basic grayscale images of the kind of morphology of the pylorus. And then we always feed them just to see um, that active fluid kind of traversing through the pylorus. So um, that is a part of our um, standard protocol. And then I have a question from um, our chat. Uh, somebody says, do we ever place an NG tube to remove the water and help prevent aspiration? Uh, we do not. Uh, we just, whatever goes into the stomach, it just, we just leave it there. We don't aspirate that fluid back out. Do you guys do anything different with that? Yeah, we we don't. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I don't think we've aspirated before. We don't aspirate either. Um, and I've actually used, I've had a case of a patient that could not receive, he was on ECMO at one day old, um, and I've used gas, like injected gas or an NG tube, uh, which is the enemy of ultrasound, but uh, it proved to be useful. A uh, small amount of air to see it crossing through the pylorus or not crossing. Um, but that was an SMA case. But no, we don't do anything with the contents of the stomach. And then another question about the what we use for the normal measurement for the mucosal layer. Um, so I, I usually use three millimeters for the muscular thickness. Um, I know there's some variability, especially with preterm infants that that's not always that can be a little bit not quite three millimeters and they can still have pyloric stenosis but at least as far as the muscular thickness I usually use three millimeters is kind of my internal cutoff for what I call normal yeah same I just think of pi so yeah. <laughs> 3.14 and then just kind of use those numbers yeah exactly because <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly can't remember more than I need to yeah <laughs> um so all right. Um, if there's no other questions, we'll move on to my favorite topic in the whole wide world. Um, so this is a 90 year old male with bilious emesis. And for some reason, you know, a pyloric ultrasound was ordered. And this time around, um, the pyloric channel channel is also widely patent. But what's different from the other case is that there's to and fro flow. And we did not give this patient any contrast. So whatever distension is already from whatever the patient had. And so given everything together is very concerning for an upper GI obstruction. Um, and so in th these cases, when you see this, don't stop there. You have to keep scanning to look for 
the reason for the obstruction. And so the reason here is that when you're following the SMA SMV, you see that the SMV just collapse or the yeah, SMV collapses and kind of swirls around the SMA, which is this echogenic collar right there. And then if you follow the duodenum is really dilated, dilate at the head. And then as you're going here to this third portion of the duodenum, you can see the beaking and then this clockwise swirling of all the bowel around the SMA. And so basically, if you've seen any of my talks before, this is make up all this until proven otherwise. And so per protocol, the patient was taken directly to the OR um, and then was found to have ischemic bowel, um, but not necrotic. And so when they um, detours the bowel, everything painted up and there was no resection needed. So like... Um, like in these cases, you know, time is bow. And so you do want to pick any kind of signs up. So if there's any signs of obstruction, you know, keep scanning, keep looking for that whirlpool sign. And Catalina, whenever you guys are ready to switch over, just let me know. I mean, otherwise I'm just going to run through these cases. Um, and then the next case is um, a 16 year old female with abdominal pain. And so this is interesting to me, and I, I'm kind of curious to what you guys think. Um, you know, we do abdominal ultrasounds day in and day out, and it's usually of the solid organs. And so this patient had a routine abdomen ultrasound, and I don't think anything um, was found to be abnormal. But um, the patient continued to have pain and had a scope and was found to have gastritis and, and other findings of inflammatory bowel disease. And so Knowing that, and I was reading the MR, um, the bowel wall was a little thickened, or the gastric wall was thickened around like four to five millimeters. And this time around, it is nicely distended. You can see the fluid. Um, and then here's that pylorus and pyloric channel. So knowing what I knew, I went back to the ultrasound before um, and looked back at the stomach. And I did feel like the mucosal, or at least like the walls, which is kind of indistinct because this is um, a curved probe, but it seem altogether thickened to me. Um, granted, you know, there's always a component of under distension and, you know, how much is thickened. I don't think that there's an established criteria for ultrasound um, or the stomach on ultrasound, but it just felt like a little bit much to me. So now looking back, I'm like, maybe we should be looking a lot closer at the stomach walls on some of these, you know, routine abdominal ultrasound, because that might be a cause for their pain, especially when the solid organs appear normal. But anyway, so this patient did have a scope, was found to have gastritis and um, was placed on acid suppression. And you can see now the walls of the stomach um, is almost paper thin, which is kind of returning to normal. Um, I mean, it's not paper thin, but it is thin uh, allowing for the, the curve probe because the detail is just not there but you can see the difference there. Um, basically, you can see the stomach usually on, I, what I've noticed is on the pancreas views and on the aorta views. Those are where you can see um, the stomach best reliably on every single uh, routine abdomen ultrasound. So I wonder if that's something that we should be looking for. And I don't know if you guys have started, you know, kind of reporting it at all if you see it or just not comfortable yet with it. Yeah, I, I find that challenging. You know, even even on CT and MR, you know, sometimes we see that in the, you know, distal esophagus or stomach that it, it kind of visually looks thick, but you're not sure if it's under distended or, you know, what the true thickness of it is. I personally kind of ignore it and just, you know, I say, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if it's just under distended. I, I, I think it's challenging to make the diagnosis of true gastric wall thickening. Uh, somebody mentioned in the our chat that they use color imaging. I, I think that you know color Doppler to you know show whether maybe a typeremic or not. I think that could be a potentially uh, useful tool. It sounds like to um, you know just give you another piece of information. It's, um, it's I think that'd be worth trying. But uh, in general, I I don't pay a whole lot of attention to the gastric wall. But I, you bring up a good point. Maybe we should. Yeah, I haven't really paid a lot of attention to, but I'm starting to. So we'll we'll see how that goes. Um, this next case is a two month old male with, um, that's an ex preemie actually had spontaneous ileal perforation at birth, um, and never really ended up doing well per se. Um, and so surgery was still concerned that there is some kind of perforation going on. There may be already an ileostomy. And so, um, there were a serial, um, abdominal radiographs. And so this is just one of them. And all of them looked kind of the same, just paucity of bowel gas, really nothing specific, um, but more importantly, no free air, but the patient um, was not doing well. So 
surgery finally wanted to do an ultrasound to kind of look a little bit more regarding the bowel and you know, surprisingly or unsurprisingly, the bowel looks really bad. And so just systematically, we started at the right lower quadrant um, and you can see the bowel walls just being really ill-defined. There's some areas where, you know, is there even bowel wall that's continuous? And then of course, on color imaging, um, there's decreased vascularity or decreased um, color or blood flow. And, but this is using normal color. And what I've been using or asking my sonographers to do is also image with um, microvascular imaging. And here you can see that there was absent flow, but you can see some flow here, but then no flow more distally where the bowel loops are a little bit more uh, indistinct or bowel walls a little bit more indistinct. And so this is the cine clip just sitting on it. So there's not much um, peristalsis at all, just respiratory motion. And then this is a cine clip just kind of going throughout that lower quadrant. And you can see the abnormal bowel loop here, um, a lot surrounded by a lot of complex fluid and then more normal collapsed small bowel loops here. So you can get a lot of information. And then you can see here on top, there's um, abdominal wall edema. And then all of this is basically uh, edematous mesentery. And then of course, you know, you march up to the right upper quadrant, same thing. You have the bowel wall that looks really um, irregular. And then if you throw on color, you have a hyperemic um, mesentery, but the bowel wall looks deficient in um, perfusion, you would think, because of the lack of blood flow on color. But if you turn on um, microvascular imaging, it nicely demonstrates that there is blood flow to here. So, you know, I've, I found that uh, microvascular imaging really improves um, blood flow detection. And so we're almost, I mean, we still do both, but I'm almost inclined to just kind of skip from here to here, um, just to, you know, if time saving is an issue. And then once again, this bowel loop in the left upper quadrant looks a little bit more aneurysmal. The bowel wall is less distinct. Um, color imaging doesn't show a lot, but uh, vascular Im microvascular imaging shows uh, blood flow here, but then none where the bowel wall is aneurysmal. And then lastly, in the left lower quadrant, this is where the bowel wall looks worse. And this is, um, you can actually see the mucosal layer just kind of bluntly stopping and then this out pouching here. And then of course, you know, we have our color and it did turn out that when the patient went to surgery, there were multiple areas of ischemia kind of correlating with all of the um, quadrants that we demonstrate absent flow in. And then um, the surgeon actually told me that there was disruption in the wall here in the left lower quadrant. And then there was like a ball of stool basically um, out pouching here. And so it correlate very nicely with our color and um, grayscale images. So this patient, um, I don't know if they specifically called necrotizing enterocolitis per se with perforation, but these, the, uh, they were just, the diagnosis was kind of left just with multiple areas of ischemia. So it's interesting. It's interesting how they ended up just calling it that and not specifically necrotizing enterocolitis for this child. But this kid just kept perfing left and right. Um, all right. So we're going to shift gears a little bit, uh, moving out of like the neonatal period. So I think, can I ask you a question about that last case real quick? Yeah. Yeah. On the, um, on, a, on a, cases like this where you don't really see the, uh, color images very well, but you see MFI, do you report that as diminished flow? Like, do you expect to see some color flow? Um, do you call this hypoperfusion? I guess is my overall question. Yeah. So Catalina, what do you think? Because I think she touches a lot on uh, perfusion. What was the question again? Sorry, I couldn't hear. If you if you have a case like this where you don't see color flow to the bowel wall, but you do see flow with microvascular imaging, do you pass that kind of as normal bowel perfusion or does that concern you? Would you call that hypoperfusion? Uh, so if I don't see, well, the first thing will be to look at the settings of your machine. I tend to keep a, a color scale between three and seven, depending on the probe and the machine that you're using. If I don't see color flow, I don't care if I get spectral flow because I don't know where that spectral flow might be coming from. And I will call it uh, that 
that bowel loop is not well is not perfused and that's worrisome for necrosis. Uh, I'm specifically going to talk about my latest paper on necrotizer enterocolitis, uh, the four new sonographic findings that are associated with poor outcome. Um, and those are the thickening of the mesentery and hyperemia, thickening of the abdominal wall, hypergenicity of the intestinal content, and poor definition, or, or as Dr. Daneman and I like to call it, ghosting of the intestinal wall. Um, uh, okay. Um, what is hyperemia in the bowel and mesentery? Um, I'm going to explain this as I do for my residents, which is very, in a very simple way, this is nothing that is written anywhere, but um, I feel that when you first start doing bowel imaging, it is very difficult to know what's normal and abnormal. Um, so I always tell them when you're imaging bowel and you don't know what hyperemia looks like, just think of testicles. We've done a lot of testicles. We've all seen a lot of Doppler flow um, of the testes and that's this is like normal flow. So if you see this in bowel, then this would be normal flow. And then if anything looks like hyperemia on a testicle, that's hyperemia in the bowel as well. As I said, this is not written anywhere. This is just like my way of explaining for people that are not used to doing bowel imaging. Uh, but have experience doing other forms of ultrasound. Uh, the first part that I'm going to talk to is about thickening and hyperemia of the mesentery. The mesentery is that suspensory uh, uh, structure that holds the uh, bowel in place attached into the retroperitoneum. So in this uh, case, we have a grayscale and a color Doppler image of a thickened mesentery. Mesentery in children is so fine, like it's such a fine and sort of structure that you actually don't see it. So my recommendation is if you're doing bowel ultrasound for NEC and you see a white mass or this appearance that is a little bit spongy form, that's the mesentery because you shouldn't see the mesentery at all. Um, if you've seen a, a post-operative pictures of a child, uh, like young babies, the mesentery is paper thin. So in old, on ultrasound, you shouldn't see it. You just see all the bowel loops clump together, um, peristalsis obviously, but you shouldn't see like a mass that is pushing the bowel loops into the periphery or surrounding them. Um, surrounding it, it will be the omentum that can also get thickened in uh, this patient. So basically what you're going to see is a heterogeneous hyper hyperemic mass that is separating the bowel loops of the intestine. Very, very important to put your Doppler flow because sometimes it can be very difficult to differentiate between a complex collection and a thick mesentery. So always put your color Doppler box on top of that area because obviously the complex collection is not going to have Doppler flow while the mesentery is the structure that carries all the vessels into the bowel loops as we drop flow. Um, collections can be very tricky. Uh, remember, the, uh, the mesentery is not like a flat structure. It actually has folds. So the collection can be uh, intertwined between the folds of the mesentery. So you do need to make sure you evaluate the entire thing with your color flow just to make sure you're not missing a collection. Um, as I said, like if you don't have a lot of experience, if you were to imagine this was a testicle and you saw this, this would be hyperemic. Please, no one quote that on anything. That's not written on any study. That's just me um, <laughs> describing it like how I teach my residents. Um, the mesentery, um, well, at the beginning of NEC, the mesentery looks very hyperechoic and it looks nearly mass-like. But as NEC progresses on what I like to call the wasted state of NEC, which is not a real term, um, it becomes like these finger-like projections um, that look like cord-like structures that are tethering the bowel loops. Uh, you should still find flow in them, um, and you can find complex collection that uh, go in between the folds of the mesentery. So yet again, please use your color doctor to make sure um, that you are evaluating indeed the mesentery and not a complex collection. Um, this is one of our patients um, and as you can see 
there is a very thick and uh, power loop with complex internal material and this hyperechoic, hypervascular structure surrounding it. That's a very thick and enraged mesentery. You can see those vessels that are feeding into this um, power loop uh, that are very thick and hyperemic. Um, next, if there are no questions so far, I'm going to talk about edema and inflammation of the abdominal wall. Uh, this is all specific to NEC. NEC is a process that we think and most likely, and well, it's what is written in the literature, it starts in the right lower quadrant in the uh, terminal ileum. And we do tend to see that these babies tend to develop uh, the how do I say this? The abdominal wall thickening starts right above the area where the bowel loops are diseased. So you see that these babies start out with um, soft tissue edema that starts in the right lower quadrant and then eventually it spreads uh, into the pelvis. And then when you get severe disease, it nearly it goes all over the abdominal wall. Um, usually, but by this time, it's when the surgeons start calling it dusky or like purplish abdominal wall, so this is pretty severe. Um, this is a normal abdominal wall, and here you guys have a thickened uh, and hyperechoic abdominal wall. You can actually see how the different layers of the abdominal wall start separating as the edema worsens, um, and I mean, these are like extreme examples of what you can see. I wish I could tell you this is uncommon, but unfortunately it is not. It is very common to see babies with NEC and uh, this edema and inflammation of the abdominal wall. Um, this is one of our patients. This is in the uh, left lower quadrant. Um, that's not a, uh, that baby had also MCKD on top of everything he had going on. Sorry, I don't know why that. Um, and then you guys can see here the uh, stranding of the abdominal wall. Um, the hyperechogenicity of the bowel content. So this is another of the new findings of NEC. To me, this is the most interest out of most interesting out of all the other factors that I discuss and I will discuss. Because um, initially, when I started doing this research project, uh, we thought this was due just to slogging off of the uh, mucosal wall, the, like the different layers of the wall, and bleeding into the lumen of the um, content, uh, sorry, into the lumen of the bowel. Um, but it was very interesting. So this study included, we had, or 40 patients, but I obviously ended up looking into more ultrasounds and I, since I like this, then I, we were not supposed to do follow up, but I went to look in, more into this because I thought that it was fascinating. Um, and it was very interesting how this content, even though it's supposed to be hemorrhage, it never develops that hematocrit phenomenon that blood in our areas does. And I was left wondering why on earth if this is just blood in like layers, why does it ever like basically a baby just poops it out and it never develops like that different stages of uh, degradation of the blood products. And it turns out that there's also mucin um, within the, uh, those luminal contents, um, which uh, mucin is uh, produced by the goblet cells in when there is an injury to the bowel um, and well anyway we ended up doing staining for mucin because this reminded me of uh, when patients have like older patients have mucinous uh, ascites um, and uh, it's very interesting and for our discussion but I this led me to believe that there is an involvement of the pancreatic enzymes in the etiology of NEC, and that's something that we, I will start doing research on. Um, it's very, very exciting. Anyway, and for our conference, basically, the hyperechogenicity of the bowel content means that there is a worse disease because it means that all of the layers are peeling off. There's mucin, and there's also bleeding into the luminal into the lumen of the wall. Um, I will tell you that it is very important to differentiate this from milk. So 
if you see this content on a baby that is coming through the ED uh, and you don't see any other findings like thickening of the uh, bowel wall, thickening of the mesentery or other features to suggest this baby can have uh, necrotized enterocolitis, please don't call this blood because uh, milk can look exactly the same thing. So as obviously like put everything into context. Not every single hyperechoic luminal content is going to be blood. It can also be food products. Anyway, here are more examples. And here is one of our contents, uh, sorry, one of our babies. He was on an oscillator. That's why it's moving like that. You can see the thickening of the abdominal wall, the thickening bowel loops, and the incre incredibly hyperechoic uh, bowel content. Um, can I ask you a question about that real quick? Sorry? Can I ask you a question about that uh, finding real quick? Sure. I, I, I'm very curious. You know, I, I think this this paper you wrote is really interesting. I'm really excited to talk about this with you. And uh, thank you again for being here. I I think that, you know, for me personally, like you mentioned, you know, the enteric contents can look hyperechoic sometimes and just be a normal finding. So I think I've kind of just glossed over it as, you know, not thinking about it too much and as a potentially pathologic finding. I remember in your paper, I think you mentioned that if they're MPO for a certain period of time before you see this finding, that it's more concerning. Do you have like a specific cutoff as far as if they've been MPO for, you know, two days or three days or some certain period of time that it makes you more concerned when you see that finding? I don't have a specific time cutoff, uh, but I can tell you this is not an early finding of NEC. You usually start seeing this with babies that have been that clinically have the diagnosis of NEC for over a week. That's, I mean, you can, all, I've seen NEC, like very bad NEC in one day, like the baby just develops horrible NEC in one day. Uh, but like in regular cases, when you don't end, develop like severe disease super quickly, it's usually a late finding. Um, and you will see it associated with other stuff. So babies with NEC, their peristalsis is, either gone or completely sluggish. Uh, so there's gonna be thickening of the wall. Uh, usually by the time they develop this uh, hyperechoic content in the bowel loops, they already have portobenous gas if they're going to develop it or it's gone, uh, or they had it like days prior, but it's definitely not an early finding. This is a late finding in, in NEC. All right, thank you. And I, I have a similar question about the the, the other finding of, of uh, kind of body wall edema or thickening. Is that, yeah. you know, at least to me conceptually, I, th I think that, you know, body wall edema or anasarca could be, be a pretty nonspecific finding. We might see that with other things. Do you only mention that if you have like other specific findings of neck? Do you use that more as a supporting, um, yes. supportive finding rather than if you only see body wall edema, you're not concerned about that unless you see other secondary findings of neck? Yes, of okay. course, because um, you can get, I mean, the baby can have cardiac disease and just have body wall edema from that, or I don't know, they have a bruise from surgery and then you end up seeing that. Uh, but yeah, you need to see um, all of these findings are not isolated. Like I can see these poor definition, ghosting of the bowel with ischemia from all reasons, um, hyperechoic content from an intraluminal uh, hematoma in the bowel loops. But obviously, that will be more uh, specific to one area, will more confined. Um, they're not specific signs that tell you this baby has NEC. They're just indicators that if in the setting of NEC you find this, it means that the baby has uh, worse, worse disease than or children, like uh, more severe disease. Okay, for definition of ghosting of the bowel, uh, we actually decided not to include this term uh, because of obviously people don't think of ghosting as a radiological term. They just think it as the dating app and the person that never replied to you and just disappears. So we ended up not really using it, but um, that's what Dr. Daniman wanted to call him, to call it anyway. Um, so it's basically that you lose that nice definition of the bowel, like is that area that you keep scanning and you're like, oh my God, like, is that a wall? Not really. Like I can sort of see a wall, but I'm not completely sure. Um, 
so that's ghosting of the bowel wall, kind of like you can see the shadow of the uh, bowel loop, but it's no longer well defined. You lose all of that gut signature and there's going to be absent flow in all of that bowel loop or part of the bowel loop like here. Um, you can start seeing a uh, complex collections associated with this. This just means that this bowel loop is dead or in the process of being necrotic. And there's already stuff that is can be extravasating uh, outside of the lumen of the bowel wall. Um, same in this area, kind of like you can kind of see that there is a bowel loop wall here, but not really. You can kind of see more the bottom. Um, same with this one here. You cannot really make out the wall uh, very well. Oops, sorry, this is still continuous clips from the same patient. You can see the enraged thicken dysentery, and then this hyperechoic content. And then this is actually, I know this because I scanned this patient. Um, that's like a fold of this bowel loop. And you can see how in the superior aspect of this uh, bowel loop, you get absolutely no flow and you can sort of see the wall but it's not really defined. Um, I scanned this patient on a Friday and this is the follow-up ultrasound on Monday. I told the surgeons I'm very worried that this patient has a necrotic bowel loop up here and that uh, this is go going to lead into perforation. They were like oh no he's fine. Uh, well this was the ultrasound on Monday. Uh, you can clearly see there is that complex collection there and you can see the hole in the bowel loop opening up into this um, complex collection. Uh, I'll play it again so you can see it. The other thing is if you see complex acidic fluid next to disease bowel loops, please don't say, oh yeah, this is just because the acidic fluid has been sitting here for a while. Uh, that's very worrisome for uh, perforation. Um, and I'm going to give a last part that is ultrasound. Uh, I know we're here to talk about ultrasound, um, but I'm going to make a short discussion of what pneumatosis intestinalis looks like on x-ray uh, because it drives me crazy when I see questionable. <laughs> I'm very passionate about NEC and I think a lot of times we don't understand as radiologists what it means for these babies when you guys call it questionable necrotizing, questionable pneumatosis. What happens when you call questionable pneumatosis is that the baby is going to get a bunch of antibiotics they don't need that worsens their prognosis, uh, puts them at risk of getting other uh, diseases, increases the chance of getting more antibiotic resistance, and the baby is going to get into an NPO state that they don't need. Um, I always tell my residents, pneumatosis is like being pregnant. Either you're pregnant or you're not pregnant. Either you have pneumatosis or you don't have pneumatosis. You're not questionably pregnant. If you think you're pregnant, if you're questionably pregnant, then you take a test. In the case of pneumatosis, you request a second view. But don't call it questionable and just be like, oh, they can do whatever they want. And like, no, that's... Be aware that that's a 27-week-old baby that is going to be put in PO with a bunch of antibiotics. So please have mercy and just call your neonatologist and tell them, can I please get a cross-table view of the abdomen and not left lateral decubitus or lateral decubitus? And I will explain later why you don't want a lateral decubitus and you do want the cross-table view. This is what pneumatosis uh, intestinalis looks like on, um, on histology. These bubbles are bacteria. It's not gas that extravasated from the lumen of the wall, which is this. It's actually bacteria that migrated from the lumen of the bowel into the submucosa, and they start creating these pockets of gas. You can see that the uh, submucosa and the mucosa, which is this, are still attached to the bowel loop. That's going to be important for the appearance that, uh, that I will describe on the plain films. And this is the muscularis mucosa and the serosa, with some large vessels here. Um, what I want all of you to do when you're looking at pneumatosis intestinalis is to look for Oreo cookies and not bread. And I will explain the bread part later. Um, so the Oreo cookies are going to have one dark uh, cookie, the cream that is going to be light, and the other, uh, the other uh, cookie that is going to be dark. The 
why part or the lucent part is going to be your uh, pneumatosis intestinalis. Um, uh, I'm really sorry. The, 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 the first cookie is going to be your pneumatosis intestinalis. The second layer is going to be, so this one is going to be the, the first cookie. Uh, it's going to be dark because it's gas. Then the following layer is going to be the mucosa and submucosa that are still attached to the bowel loop, um, which is this. And then the second layer, which is going to be also a radiolucent, is going to be the lumen. Um, so you can kind of see that here. You see how you have your first cookie, uh, which is the pneumatosis intestinalis. Then you find your cream, and then you find your other cookie, which is the lumen. It's a very thick Oreo cookie. I actually don't like the cream of Oreo cookie, so this is a nice Oreo cookie with a very thick cookie. Um, same of kind of what you're seeing here. The pneumatosis, the cream, so the mucosa and submucosa, and the lumen of the uh, bowel loop. So this is what you're seeing. Um, I don't like pneumatosis intestinalis a lot for necrotizing enterocolitis. The reason is that uh, babies with NEC can have or they might not develop, a, I mean, how do I say this? The pneumatosis intestinalis can uh, come and go very quickly, so we might miss it. So not seeing pneumatosis intestinalis doesn't mean that the baby doesn't have any C. It just means that we didn't catch it. Uh, same with portovenous gas. I've seen babies with massive amounts of portovenous gas, and one hour later, they have a chest plane film, and there's absolutely nothing in the liver. Uh, and actually, the disappearance of both portal venous gas and pneumatosis intestinalis do not correlate with a prognosis or outcome. So they don't mean, it doesn't mean that the baby is getting better because what can be happening is that this got so severe that the entire mucosa and submucosa are sludging off and you're not seeing it because you no longer have a layer where the bacteria can grow and create those uh, gas bubbles. So remember, look for Oreo cookies. On the other hand, um, if you find a bread in the bowel, uh, so appearance like this, like that model it loosens throughout the colon, um, this actually, you guys don't have a word for this in English, but this is miga in Spanish, uh, and that's the cortex of the bread. Uh, if you find this model appearance in the bowel loops, that's bread, and bread means poop. So please don't call poop. Model lucencies are not uh, are not pneumatosis intestinalis. You need to find those lines, the white lines, so the Oreo cookie. Um, same here. Bread, not poop. Um, okay. And the last thing that I want to say is please, please don't request um, lateral uh, use of the a abdomen always requires a cross-table view. Uh, the reason being most of these babies with NEC, they spend most of their time on their back. And as you've seen on all the previous cases that we've shown, uh, these babies have very complex uh, fluid inside of their bowel loops. They're gonna have an ileus. Uh, so by the time they perforate, the amount of gas that is going to come out is minimal, if anything. Uh, so Imagine if you have one tiny little bubble that is embedded in a bunch of complex content. By the time they turn him to one side, take the plain film, that tiny little bubble is going to have absolutely no time to move up to the left or right side of the abdomen. So always, always cross table view. Never, please, please, never left lateral decubitus. There, you can miss pneumoperitoneums on that way. Uh, that's everything from my part. Thank you.